The rusted sign creaked in the wind, barely clinging to its wooden post. Welcome to Stillwood, population 32. Kelly squinted at it through the dust-covered windshield, her GPS blinking out in confusion as if the town itself was too insignificant to exist. She pulled her car to a stop, the only sound the faint ticking of the cooling engine. The road ahead dissolved into thick woods, an uninviting tunnel of ancient trees that swallowed the daylight. I'm so lost, she muttered, pulling out her phone, but of course there was no signal. The device was as dead as the road she'd driven on for miles, an unending ribbon of cracked asphalt cutting through miles of cornfields, barren farmlands, and nothing else. Kelly had been on her way to a music festival, a chance to escape the dreariness of her life for a weekend, but a wrong turn had taken her deep into unfamiliar territory. She was too stubborn to turn back, convinced she could find her way if she just kept going. But now, she wasn't so sure. She scanned the deserted surroundings, hoping for some sign of life, but the town seemed abandoned. The houses that lined the main street were dilapidated, windows dark and hollow like empty eye sockets. A chill ran down her spine. Still, she had to find out where she was. Kelly stepped out of the car, her boots crunching on the gravel. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and decay. She spotted a general store across the street, its paint peeling, but the door slightly ajar. It was the only place that seemed remotely functional. Hello? Kelly called as she pushed the door open. A small bell jingled overhead, but no one answered. The store was dimly lit, shelves lined with dusty cans and faded boxes. A single bulb flickered in the back, casting eerie shadows. Can I help you? The voice made Kelly jump. An old woman stood behind the counter, and the fury, her wrinkled hands, busy knitting something with dark, almost black yarn. Her eyes were sharp, too sharp, Kelly thought, for someone so frail looking. Uh, yeah, I'm lost, Kelly said, forcing a smile. I was hoping you could tell me how to get back to the highway. The old woman didn't respond immediately. Her fingers moved with unsettling precision, the knitting needles clicking rhythmically. Not many people come this way, she finally said, her voice low and scratchy. Not many leave either, Kelly frowned. Excuse me? The woman's eyes met hers, and Kelly swore they were clouded with something. Was it pity? The road's been closed for years. Most folks moved on, but some of us stayed. Stillwood doesn't let go easily. Unnerved, Kelly glanced around the store again, her unease growing. Look, I just need directions, okay? I really need to get back. The old woman's smile was thin, more of a grimace. There's a way, but it's not the road you came on. Go back out, take the first left after the gas station. Keep driving, no matter what you see or hear. You'll know when you're out. Thank you, Kelly said, eager to leave. The woman's words didn't make sense, but anything was better than staying here. As she turned to leave, the old woman called after her. Don't stray from the path, and if you see the harvesters, don't stop. Kelly's heart skipped a beat. What? But the woman had already gone back to her knitting, though it was as if the conversation never happened. Shaking off the encounter, Kelly hurried out of the store and back to her car. She found the gas station easily enough, a crumbling relic from another era, its pumps long dry. The left turn led to a narrow, dirt road that wound into the woods. The trees pressed in from both sides, their gnarled branches forming a canopy that blocked out the sun. As Kelly drove, the silence grew oppressive. The air seemed to thicken, each breath a struggle. The road became rougher, the car jostling violently as she pressed on. Suddenly, a movement in the rearview mirror caught her eye. Figures, tall and gaunt, moved among the trees. Their silhouettes were wrong, limbs too long, heads too large. They walked with an eerie, stilted gait, carrying what looked like old farming tools, scythes, sickles, and pitchforks. The harvesters. Kelly's hands tightened on the wheel. She remembered the old woman's warning, don't stop. She pressed down on the gas pedal, trying to keep her eyes forward, but the figures were everywhere, flanking the road on both sides, closing in. Their faces were obscured, but she could feel their eyes on her, empty and soulless. The road twisted sharply, and Kelly struggled to keep control of the car. The engine roared in protest, the headlights barely cutting through the thickening fog. The harvesters kept pace, always just at the edge of her vision, relentless. A sound filled the air, low and rhythmic, like the drumming of a heartbeat. It grew louder, more insistent, as the figures began to close the distance. Kelly's panic soared. She pressed the pedal harder, 
but the car seemed to slow, the road stretching endlessly ahead. Then, without warning, the road ended. Her car skidded to a stop just before the edge of a deep ravine. Kelly's breath came in ragged gasps as she realized there was no way forward. She had no choice. She turned the car around, her heart pounding in her chest. The harvesters stood in the middle of the road, blocking her path. There was no escape. Kelly's mind raced, but before she could react, the nearest figure stepped forward. It raised its scythe high, and the fog parted, revealing a face she recognized. The old woman from the store. Kelly's scream echoed through the forest as the harvesters descended, their tools glinting in the fading light. The car door wrenched open, and she was dragged out into the cold earth. The last thing she saw before darkness claimed her was the old woman's smile, cruel and satisfied. Stillwood didn't let go easily. And as Kelly's screams faded into the night, the harvesters returned to their silent vigil, waiting for the next traveler to wander into the middle of nowhere. Story number two. The vast expanse of the Nevada desert swallowed the tiny road, stretching endlessly into the horizon. Angela gripped the steering wheel tightly, her knuckles white as she glanced nervously at the gas gauge. The needle had dipped below empty miles ago, and now, as the sun began its descent, casting an eerie orange glow over the barren landscape, she felt a knot of dread tighten in her stomach. She had been driving for hours, fleeing the city after a bitter breakup, seeking solace in solitude. But this, this was too much solitude. The road ahead was empty, and behind her nothing but dust and echoes of her past. The radio had died hours ago, leaving only the hum of the engine and the whisper of wind through the cracked windows. A sign appeared in the distance, faded and worn, Welcome to Stillwater, Population 4. Angela squinted at the sign as she passed it. Four? That couldn't be right. A town with only four people? Curiosity mingled with her growing unease as she continued down the road. Soon, a cluster of dilapidated buildings emerged from the desert haze. She slowed down as she approached, eyes scanning for any sign of life. The gas station was the first thing she noticed, its pumps rusted and long abandoned. She pulled in, hoping against hope that there might be someone who could help her. She parked near the entrance and stepped out of the car, the dry heat of the desert immediately pressing down on her. Hello? She called out her voice sounding small and out of place in the stillness. Silence. Angela walked up to the door of the gas station, her footsteps crunching on the cracked pavement. The door creaked as she pushed it open, revealing a dimly lit interior. Dust hung in the air, and the shelves were sparsely stocked with ancient, expired products. She approached the counter, tapping the bell, though she doubted anyone would come. Ding, ding, no one responded. She sighed, turning to leave, but a flicker of movement in the corner of her eye made her freeze. Slowly, she turned back. A man stood behind the counter, his face hidden in the shadows. His clothes were old and threadbare, and his skin had an unnatural pallor, as if he hadn't seen the sun in years. Need some help? His voice was raspy, like dry leaves scraping against the ground. Angela took a step back, her pulse quickening. I, I ran out of gas, she stammered. Is there any way I can get a refill? The man tilted his head, studying her with unsettling intensity. Gas? Sure, I can get you some, but it'll cost ya. She nodded quickly, desperate to get back on the road. Whatever it costs, I'll pay. He nodded once, slowly, and disappeared into the back room. Angela waited, her nerves on edge. Something about this place felt wrong, very wrong, but she didn't have many options. She stepped outside to escape the oppressive atmosphere inside, but the silence out here was just as suffocating. The air was still, not even a breeze to stir the dust. A soft rustling sound made her jump. She spun around, scanning the area, but saw nothing. Her breath quickened as she heard it again. Closer this time, a faint shuffling like footsteps on gravel. She turned toward the sound and saw a figure standing at the edge of the gas station's lot, partially obscured by the shadows of the old buildings. Hello? She called out again, her voice trembling. The figure didn't move. Angela squinted, trying to make out the details, but the setting sun cast long shadows, distorting her vision. The figure appeared to be watching her, its posture unnaturally stiff. Slowly, it raised an arm, pointing directly at her. Angela's heart pounded in her chest as fear gripped her. She glanced back at the gas station door, hoping the man would return soon. But when she looked back at the figure, it was gone. 
She blinked, her mind racing. Had she imagined it? The heat, the isolation, it could all be playing tricks on her. But deep down, she knew something was wrong. Every instinct screamed at her to leave, but without gas, she was stranded. The door to the gas station creaked open, and the man reappeared, holding a jerry can. Got your gas, he said with a grin that didn't reach his eyes. Angela forced a smile, her hands trembling as she took the can from him. Thank you, she mumbled, moving quickly to fill her tank. Every second felt like an eternity as she waited for the gas to flow. She kept glancing over her shoulder, half expecting that figure to reappear. Once the tank was full, she returned the can to the man, offering him a handful of bills. He accepted them without counting, his gaze never leaving her face. You take care now, he said, his voice low and eerie. Stillwater's not a place for strangers after dark. Angela didn't need to be told twice. She hurried back to her car, her heart racing as she started the engine. She pulled out of the lot, her tires kicking up dust as she sped down the road. The sun had dipped below the horizon now, casting the desert in deep purple shadows. As she drove, the unease settled into her bones. She glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see that figure again. But the road behind her was empty. Still, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. Miles passed and the tension in her chest began to ease. She told herself she was overreacting, that the isolation had gotten to her, the gas station, the strange man, the figure, it was all just a trick of her mind. She exhaled deeply, focusing on the road ahead. But then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw something, a flicker of movement in the passenger seat. Her heart leapt into her throat as she turned her head. There, sitting beside her was the figure from the gas station. Its face was gaunt and pale, eyes hollow and unblinking, its mouth twisted into a grotesque grin. It raised a hand and pointed straight ahead. Angela screamed, jerking the wheel in a panic. The car swerved off the road, crashing into the desert sand. Her vision blurred as the world spun around her, and then, darkness. When she awoke, she was back in the gas station. The same dim light flickered overhead, the same shelves lined with dusty expired products. But this time, the sign outside had changed. Population, five. Story number three. The gas gauge flirted with empty as Rebecca drove down the barren highway, an unending ribbon of asphalt stretching into the abyss. Her phone's GPS had stopped working hours ago, and with no signal and a dying battery, she was alone in every sense of the word. The sun was setting behind her, casting long, menacing shadows over the endless desert. She hadn't seen another car or even a road sign for miles. Panic simmered beneath her calm exterior. This trip was supposed to be a fresh start, a way to leave the chaos of the city behind, but now, all it seemed to be was a mistake. The engine sputtered, then died, leaving Rebecca stranded in silence. She coasted to the side of the road, gravel crunching beneath the tires, and sat there for a moment, trying to collect her thoughts. The nearest town had to be at least 50 miles back. She cursed herself for not filling up at the last gas station. Stepping out of the car, Rebecca surveyed her surroundings. The vast desert stretched out in every direction, barren and unforgiving. A cold breeze swept across the landscape, sending a shiver down her spine despite the lingering heat of the day. The sun dipped lower, the sky turning a deep orange that bled into purple. As she reached back into the car to grab her jacket, she noticed something on the horizon, a small dark shape that hadn't been there before. It was distant, barely more than a dot against the sky, but unmistakably real. Perhaps it was a house or some kind of structure. Maybe she wasn't alone after all. With no other options, Rebecca decided to walk toward it. She kept an eye on the car as it grew smaller and smaller behind her until it was swallowed by the twilight. The structure loomed larger as she approached, Mike revealing itself to be a dilapidated cabin, its wood weathered and gray. It stood like a forgotten relic, defying time in this desolate place. Relief washed over her as she reached the porch, but it was tempered by a nagging sense of unease. There were no signs of life, no lights, no sounds, nothing but the wind whispering through the cracks in the walls. Rebecca hesitated, hand hovering over the doorknob. Her rational mind told her this place was abandoned, but something deeper, a primal instinct, warned her to stay away. Ignoring the warning, she pushed the door open. It creaked on rusty hinges, the sound echoing through the empty rooms. 
Inside, the cabin was just as she expected. Dusty, neglected, and eerily quiet. A single chair sat in the middle of the room, facing a stone fireplace that hadn't seen a fire in years. The only other furniture was a small wooden table pushed against the far wall, its surface littered with yellowed papers. Rebecca walked further in, the floorboards groaning under her weight. She picked up one of the papers from the table, squinting in the dim light to make out the faded text. It appeared to be a journal entry, written in a spidery scrawl. March 13th. The isolation is getting to me. I hear things at night, voices carried on the wind. They tell me to leave, but where would I go? There's nothing out there but endless desert. The entry ended abruptly, the ink smeared as if the writer had been interrupted. Rebecca set the paper down, a chill running through her. She couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. A sudden noise from upstairs made her jump, a soft thump like something being dropped. Her heart raced as she glanced toward the staircase. The darkness up there was impenetrable, a void that swallowed the fading light. Every instinct screamed at her to leave, but her curiosity overpowered her fear. Taking a deep breath, she started up the stairs, each step creaking louder than the last. At the top, a narrow hallway stretched out before her, lined with closed doors. She moved cautiously, listening for any other sounds. The door at the far end of the hall was slightly ajar, a sliver of darkness beckoning her. With trembling hands, Rebecca pushed it open. The room was small, with nothing but a bed and a wardrobe. Moonlight filtered through a grimy window, casting long shadows across the floor. Something on the bed caught her eye, a figure lying under the covers, completely still. Rebecca's breath caught in her throat. It was a man, his face hidden beneath the blanket. She reached out to touch him, to wake him, but something stopped her. A terrible thought struck her. What if he wasn't asleep? Summoning her courage, she pulled the blanket back. The man's face was pale, his eyes open and unseeing. He was dead. Panic surged through Rebecca, her mind racing. How long had he been here, and what had killed him? As she backed away, something glinted in the corner of the room, a small metallic object peeking out from under the wardrobe. Her heart pounded as she bent down to retrieve it, fingers brushing against cold metal. It was a key. Attached to it was a small brass tag engraved with the number 23. Suddenly, the door slammed shut behind her, Zupatitan plunging the room into darkness. Rebecca whirled around, her breath coming in short gasps. She fumbled for the doorknob, but it wouldn't turn. She was trapped. Then she heard it, the whispering. It started low, barely audible, but quickly grew louder, filling the room with unintelligible voices. They seemed to be coming from the walls, the floor, everywhere. She pressed her hands over her ears, but the voices only grew louder, more insistent. Leave, leave, leave. She pounded on the door, desperate to escape. The whispers turned into screams, the cacophony unbearable. Just when she thought she couldn't take it anymore, the door flew open, and she stumbled out into the hallway. The voices stopped abruptly, leaving her in stunned silence. Gasping for breath, Rebecca fled down the stairs, through the cabin, and out into the night. The desert air was cold against her flushed skin, but she didn't stop running until the cabin was a distant speck behind her. She didn't know how long she ran, only that she couldn't stop. Her legs burned, her lungs ached, but the fear drove her onward. When she finally collapsed to the ground, exhausted, she looked back, expecting to see the cabin. But there was nothing. The cabin had vanished, as if it had never been there. Rebecca lay on the cold, hard ground, her mind racing. The key was still clutched in her hand, its metal cold against her skin. She didn't know what it opened, but she knew one thing. She wasn't alone in the desert. The night pressed in around her, the silence heavy and oppressive. As she lay there, a new sound reached her ears, footsteps crunching on the gravel. And then, a voice, low and familiar, whispered in her ear. Welcome home. Story number four. The dense forest surrounded the lonely stretch of highway like an impenetrable wall. Tall pines loomed overhead, their twisted branches blotting out the sky. Samantha squinted through the windshield as the last traces of daylight faded away, replaced by the inky blackness of night. She had been driving for hours, her GPS long lost to a dead signal, leaving her navigating blindly in what felt like the middle of nowhere. She cursed under her breath, gripping the wheel tightly as she pressed on, hoping to find some semblance of civilization. The road was narrow, 
winding through the forest with no signs of another car, another person, or even a town. The silence was unnerving, broken only by the occasional rustling of the wind in the trees. Then out of nowhere, her headlights illuminated a figure standing on the side of the road. Samantha's heart skipped a beat. She slammed on the brakes, the car skidding slightly as it came to a stop. The figure stood still, bathed in the harsh glow of her headlights. It was a woman, her clothes tattered and dirty, her hair hanging in unkempt strands over her face. She seemed out of place, like she had wandered out of the depths of the forest. Samantha hesitated, her hand hovering over the door handle. Every instinct screamed at her to keep driving, but the woman's helpless appearance tugged at her. She rolled down the window, leaning out cautiously. Are you okay? Do you need help? She called out. The woman didn't respond. Instead, she lifted her head slowly, revealing wide, hollow eyes that seemed to stare straight through Samantha. A chill ran down Samantha's spine as the woman took a step forward, her movements slow and deliberate. Something wasn't right. I, I'm sorry, I can't stop, Samantha stammered, rolling up the window quickly. She shifted the car into drive and hit the gas, speeding past the woman without looking back. Her heart pounded in her chest as she watched the woman disappear in the rearview mirror, swallowed by the darkness once more. Samantha tried to calm herself, telling herself that it was just some lost traveler. But the unsettling feeling lingered. She checked her phone again, hoping for a signal, but the screen remained blank. She was alone, trapped in a forest that seemed to go on forever. Minutes passed in tense silence. Then, as if on cue, her engine sputtered. Samantha's eyes widened in panic as the car began to slow, the dashboard lights flickering. She pulled over to the side of the road, the car shuddering to a halt. No, 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 she muttered, frantically trying to restart the engine. But the car remained stubbornly dead, the silence around her growing thicker by the second. Samantha gripped the steering wheel, trying to steady her breathing. She was stranded, alone, in the middle of a forest with no way to call for help. Her mind raced through a thousand worst-case scenarios. What was she supposed to do now? She debated staying in the car for the night, but the thought of the woman she had passed sent a shiver down her spine. She needed to find help, or at least somewhere safe. Reluctantly, she grabbed her flashlight from the glove compartment and stepped out of the car, the night air cool against her skin. The forest was eerily quiet, the towering trees casting long, menacing shadows. Samantha shone her flashlight ahead, the beam cutting through the darkness. She began walking down the road, her footsteps echoing in the stillness. As she walked, she became acutely aware of how isolated she was. The darkness seemed to press in from all sides, and every rustle in the bushes made her jump. She could feel the weight of the forest's gaze on her, as if the trees themselves were watching her every move. Then, she heard it, a soft whisper, barely audible over the sound of her own breathing. Samantha froze, shining her flashlight in every direction. There was no one around, nothing but the endless trees. She strained her ears, trying to make out the source of the sound. Another whisper, this time clearer. It was a voice, faint and distant, calling her name. Samantha. Her blood ran cold. She hadn't imagined it. Someone or something was out there, and it knew her name. Panic surged through her as she began to walk faster, her flashlight shaking in her trembling hand. She needed to get out of here, needed to find help. The whispers grew louder, closer, surrounding her from every direction. Samantha. She broke into a run, the beam of her flashlight bouncing wildly as she sprinted down the road. The whispers followed her, insistent, relentless, they echoed through the trees, growing louder and more urgent. Samantha, come back. She stumbled, nearly falling, but caught herself just in time. Her breath came in ragged gasps as she pushed herself to keep running. The road stretched on endlessly, no sign of a town, no sign of escape. And then, just ahead, she saw it. A small house nestled in the trees, its windows glowing with a soft, warm light. Relief washed over her as she raced toward it, her legs burning with exhaustion. She reached the front door, pounding on it desperately. Please, someone help me, she shouted. The door creaked open and an elderly woman appeared, her face lined with age but kind. My dear, what are you doing out here all alone? She asked, her voice gentle. Samantha could barely catch her breath. I, I got stranded. My car broke down and something's out there. Something's following me. 
the woman's expression softened with sympathy. Come inside, child. You're safe here. Samantha didn't hesitate. She stepped inside, the warmth of the house a stark contrast to the cold fear that had gripped her outside. The door closed behind her with a soft click, and for the first time in what felt like hours, she allowed herself to relax. The woman led her to a chair by the fire, offering her a cup of tea. Samantha sipped it gratefully, the heat soothing her frayed nerves. Thank you, she whispered. I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't found this place. The woman smiled, her eyes twinkling with something that Samantha couldn't quite place. You were meant to find us, dear. We've been waiting for you. Samantha's hand froze mid-sip. What do you mean? The woman's smile widened and the warmth in the room suddenly felt oppressive. You didn't think you were truly alone out there, did you? Before Samantha could react, she heard it again, a whisper, soft and familiar, coming from just behind her. Samantha, come back. She turned slowly, her heart pounding in her chest. There, standing in the doorway, was the woman from the road. But now, she wasn't alone. Shadows seemed to cling to her, swirling and writhing. And behind her, more figures began to emerge from the darkness, their hollow eyes fixed on Samantha. The elderly woman's voice dropped to a whisper as she leaned in close. You should have kept driving, dear. Samantha's scream echoed through the forest, swallowed by the night as the whispers closed in. Story number five. Rain poured down in sheets as Caleb's truck rattled along the winding mountain road. The sky was a deep, oppressive gray, and the narrow road was lined with towering pine trees that seemed to close in on him with every mile. He had been driving for hours, trying to outrun the storm, but it had caught up with him, turning the dirt road into a slick, muddy mess. The cabin was supposed to be a retreat, a place to clear his head after everything that had happened. A fresh start, his friends had said. You'll be fine, Caleb. Just get away for a bit. He wasn't sure if he believed them. The accident had shattered his life, left him with more scars than just the ones on his skin. His fiancée, Emily, was gone, and he had been the one driving. No amount of time in a cabin was going to change that. The truck's headlights barely cut through the downpour, light illuminating a small wooden sign that marked the turnoff to the cabin. Caleb squinted through the rain-smeared windshield and made the sharp turn onto a gravel path, the truck's tires struggling for traction on the wet ground. The cabin came into view, nestled among the trees, its wooden exterior dark with age and moisture. It was smaller than he had expected, almost quaint, with a stone chimney and a porch that sagged slightly under the weight of years. It looked like it had been here forever, weathering countless storms. He parked the truck and sat there for a moment, listening to the rain drum against the roof. The silence inside the cabin would be unbearable, but it was better than the storm outside. With a sigh, he grabbed his bag and made a dash for the front door. Inside, the cabin was simple, furnished with the basics, an old leather couch, a coffee table, and a wood-burning stove that looked like it hadn't been used in years. A staircase led to a small loft where a single bed awaited him. The air was musty and the smell of damp wood lingered, but it was dry and warm, a refuge from the storm. Caleb dropped his bag by the door and went to the stove, struggling with the rusty latch before finally getting it open. He found a stack of logs by the hearth and got a fire going, the crackling flames bringing a bit of life to the dim room. As he settled into the couch, the wind howled outside, rattling the windows in their frames. Caleb stared into the fire, trying to let its warmth seep into his bones, trying to forget. But the memories were relentless, clawing at the edges of his mind. He closed his eyes and tried to breathe, focusing on the sound of the fire, the rain, anything but the silence that threatened to swallow him whole. Then, over the crackling fire in the wind, he heard it, a faint sound, just barely there, a whisper. Caleb's eyes snapped open. He held his breath, listening intently, but all he heard was the storm outside. He shook his head, chalking it up to his imagination. He was alone out here. Of course, he was. But as the minutes passed, the whispering returned, clearer this time, yet still unintelligible, like voices carried on the wind. Caleb's heart pounded in his chest, and he forced himself to stand, his legs shaky. It was just the wind, he told himself, just the storm playing tricks on his mind. He moved to the window, peering out into the darkness. The rain blurred everything into a shapeless mass, 
but there was nothing out there, no movement, no signs of life. The whispering grew louder, more insistent, and it seemed to be coming from the walls, the very structure of the cabin. Caleb stepped back, his pulse quickening. The sound was familiar, like a voice he should know, but couldn't quite place. Suddenly, the room felt too small, too confined. He grabbed his jacket and stumbled outside, needing to escape the oppressive atmosphere. The rain was icy against his skin, but he didn't care. He ran to the edge of the tree line, the wet earth sucking at his boots, and looked back at the cabin. It stood there, dark and silent, as if it were just an ordinary building. But Caleb knew better. Something was wrong. He could feel it. The whispering hadn't stopped. Even out here, away from the cabin, the voices followed him, growing louder, clearer. His heart raced as he realized they were calling his name. Caleb? He spun around, searching the darkness, but there was no one there. Just the rain and the trees, swaying in the wind. His breath came in ragged gasps, his thoughts a jumbled mess. Then he saw it, a figure standing just beyond the tree line, barely visible in the downpour. A woman, her face obscured by the rain, her form indistinct. Caleb's blood ran cold. He knew who it was. Emily, he whispered, his voice trembling. But the figure didn't move, didn't respond. It just stood there watching him. Fear gripped him, rooting him to the spot. This couldn't be real. Emily was gone, had been gone for months. But here she was, in the middle of nowhere, calling to him. The whispering intensified, swirling around him, drowning out the storm. It was her voice, but not just hers. There were others, voices he didn't recognize, all whispering his name, pulling him back toward the cabin. Caleb stumbled backward, shaking his head, refusing to believe it. This was madness. He had to get out of here, had to leave this cursed place. But as he turned to run, the figure stepped forward, out of the shadows. The rain didn't touch her, didn't obscure her any longer. Her face was pale, her eyes hollow and empty, her mouth twisted into a sad smile. Come home, Caleb, she whispered, her voice echoing in his mind. Come home. He froze, unable to move, unable to think. The world around him seemed to blur, the rain, the trees, the cabin all fading into nothingness. All that remained was her, her eyes locked on his. Then everything went black. When Caleb awoke, he was lying on the cold, hard ground, soaked to the bone. The rain had stopped and the sky was beginning to lighten with the first hints of dawn. He sat up slowly, his head pounding, his body aching. The cabin loomed in front of him, dark and silent, but different somehow. It looked older, more decayed, as if it had been abandoned for years. His heart sank as he realized what had happened. He had seen her, really seen her. But it wasn't Emily. It couldn't have been. Whatever that thing was, it had lured him out here, away from safety, away from the truth. And now he was alone, truly alone, with nothing but the echo of her voice in his mind. Come home, it whispered over and over as the darkness closed in around him once more. Story number six. The rain had started as a gentle drizzle, but by the time Maria realized she was lost, it had turned into a relentless downpour. She cursed under her breath, squinting through the windshield as her car's wipers struggled to keep up with the water streaming down. Her GPS had failed her an hour ago, leaving her stranded on a narrow, winding road that wasn't marked on any map. Maria had been on her way to visit her grandmother, a last-minute decision that now felt like a mistake. She hadn't been to this part of the state in years, and the landscape had changed, or perhaps it was just her memory that had faded. The road, flanked by dense woods, seemed to go on forever, leading her deeper into an unfamiliar wilderness. Her eyes caught a sign ahead, barely visible in the sheets of rain. Marrow's End, population, 147. Relief washed over her as she realized she had finally found a town. The name was unfamiliar, but any place was better than being stranded in the middle of nowhere. Maria slowed down as she entered the town, noticing that it was eerily quiet. The buildings were old, their paint chipped and windows dark. The street was deserted, not a single car in sight. She drove slowly, searching for a place to stop and ask for directions when she spotted a small cafe with a flickering neon sign that read, Open. She parked her car and dashed through the rain to the door, her footsteps splashing in the puddles. The doorbell chimed as she entered, but the cafe was empty. The air inside was warm, carrying the faint scent of coffee and something sweet, but there was an unsettling stillness. Hello? Maria called out, shaking off the rain from her coat. 
She looked around, noticing the outdated decor, faded wallpaper, wooden booths, and a counter with a few empty stools. There was a single plate on the counter, a slice of pie sitting untouched. Be with you in a moment, a voice called from the back, startling her. A moment later, a man emerged from the kitchen, wiping his hands on a dish towel. He was in his mid-forties, with graying hair and tired eyes. His expression was neutral, but something about his demeanor set Maria on edge. Sorry to bother you, Maria said, forcing a smile. I'm a little lost. My GPS died, and I'm trying to find my way back to the highway. The man's eyes seemed to darken as he took in her words. Highway's a bit tricky from here, he said slowly, as if choosing his words carefully. Not many folks come through Marrow's End anymore. Maria noticed his hesitation, and a chill ran down her spine. Is there a way out? I'm really in a hurry. The man nodded, though his expression remained unrateable. There's an old road, just outside town. It'll take you where you need to go, but it's not on any map. You'll have to be careful, though. It's easy to get turned around. Thank you, Maria said, eager to leave. She couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, though she couldn't put her finger on it. Can you point me in the right direction? The man wiped his hands again and nodded toward the door. Head out the way you came, then take the first right after the church. Keep going straight and don't stop until you see the old signpost. If you reach the bridge, you've gone too far. Maria thanked him again and hurried out of the cafe, feeling the weight of his gaze on her back. The rain had lessened to a drizzle, but the sky was still dark, the clouds heavy with the promise of more. She got into her car, turned on the engine, and followed the man's directions. The road took her past a small, weathered church, its steeple barely visible through the mist. As she drove, the town of Marrow's End seemed to vanish behind her, swallowed by the encroaching woods. The road became rougher, the trees denser, their branches forming a canopy that blocked out what little light remained. Maria kept her eyes on the road, searching for the signpost the man had mentioned. Her heart pounded with unease, the silence pressing in on her. After what felt like an eternity, she saw it, an old, rusted sign, leaning precariously to one side. The letters were barely legible, but it was the signpost he'd described. Maria let out a breath she hadn't realized she was holding and continued driving. The road narrowed, becoming little more than a dirt path, winding through the thick forest. The trees loomed closer, their trunks twisted and gnarled. The air felt heavy, oppressive, as if the forest itself was closing in around her. Suddenly, the car's headlights flickered and the engine sputtered. Panic surged through her as the car slowed, then came to a halt. Maria tried turning the key, but the engine wouldn't start. She was stranded. Not now, please not now, she whispered, fear creeping into her voice. She grabbed her phone, but there was still no signal. Outside, the forest was deathly silent, the only sound her own ragged breathing. Maria stepped out of the car, clutching her phone like a lifeline. She had no choice but to walk. She remembered the man's words, don't stop, keep going straight. The path was barely visible now, overgrown with weeds and vines. As she walked, Maria noticed something strange. The trees ahead seemed to shift, their positions subtly changing as she approached. She blinked, thinking it was a trick of the light, but the unsettling feeling persisted. The path behind her had vanished, swallowed by the forest. She picked up her pace, trying to ignore the growing sense of dread. The air felt colder, the mist thicker. Her footsteps echoed in the stillness, unnaturally loud. And then she heard it, a rustling in the trees, a low whisper that sent shivers down her spine. Maria froze, straining to listen, but the whispering stopped. She turned, scanning the darkened woods, but saw nothing. The path was barely visible now, and she had the sinking feeling that she was walking in circles. Panic set in as she realized she was lost. The path had led her nowhere, deeper into the forest with no way out. The whispering started again, louder this time, surrounding her from all sides. Shadows moved in the corners of her vision, darting between the trees. Hello? Maria called out, her voice trembling. There was no response, only the whispering, growing louder, more insistent. It sounded like voices, but she couldn't make out the words. She started running, desperate to escape, but the forest seemed to close in around her. The trees twisted and warped, their branches reaching out like skeletal hands. The path was gone, replaced by a tangle of roots and brambles. And then she saw them, 
figures emerging from the mist, their forms vague and shifting. They surrounded her, closing in from all sides. Their faces were obscured, their eyes dark voids that seemed to pull her in. Maria backed away, her heart hammering in her chest. She realized with horror that the figures were the same ones she had passed in Marrow's End. The cafe, the church, the streets. They were all here, waiting for her. No, she whispered, tears streaming down her face. She turned and ran. But the figures were everywhere, their whispers filling her mind. The forest twisted around her, the path vanishing completely. And then she saw it, an old bridge, its wood rotted and broken. The man had said not to go this far, but she had no choice. She sprinted toward it, hoping for an escape, but as she reached the edge, the ground gave way beneath her. Maria fell into darkness, the whispering voices consuming her, pulling her into the void. The last thing she heard before everything went black was the sound of the rain, gentle and unrelenting. In Marrow's End, the cafe's doorbell chimed as another traveler entered, seeking shelter from the storm. The man behind the counter looked up, a thin smile on his lips. Can I help you? He asked, his voice calm and steady, as if nothing had happened. But outside, in the depths of the forest, another path appeared, waiting to claim its next victim. Story number seven. The coastal town of Hemlock Point was a quiet, forgotten place, perched on the edge of a rugged cliff overlooking the endless ocean. Its population had dwindled over the years, leaving behind only a handful of stubborn residents who clung to the old ways and whispered of curses that lingered in the salt-laden air. Claire had come to Hemlock Point to escape her own troubles. The city had become unbearable, filled with memories she couldn't outrun. She needed somewhere remote, somewhere no one could find her. When she had stumbled upon a listing for a cheap rental cottage in Hemlock Point, it had seemed like fate. The drive to the town had been long, winding through miles of dense, fog-shrouded forest. As she descended the final hill, the town revealed itself, a cluster of weathered houses, their paint peeling under the relentless sea wind. The cottage was nestled at the far end, Vath near the cliff's edge, with a stunning view of the ocean stretching out as far as the eye could see. But as beautiful as the view was, there was something unsettling about it. The fog seemed thicker here, hanging low over the water, and the sound of distant waves crashing against the rocks below had an eerie, rhythmic quality. Claire unpacked her things, trying to shake off the unease that had crept in with the fog. The cottage was old, but cozy enough. She lit a fire in the hearth and settled in for the evening, hoping that the peace and quiet of Hemlock Point would help her find the clarity she desperately needed. Night fell quickly, bringing with it a deep, penetrating cold. The wind howled outside, rattling the windows, but inside, the fire crackled warmly. Claire curled up on the worn sofa, her mind finally beginning to settle. Then, just as she was drifting off to sleep, she heard it. A faint sound, almost imperceptible at first. She sat up, straining to listen. It was a distant ringing, soft and melodic, like the sound of bells carried on the wind. She frowned, walking to the window and peering out into the fog. The sound seemed to be coming from the direction of the ocean, but there was nothing out there, just the dark, churning waters far below the cliff. Claire shook her head, telling herself it was just the wind playing tricks on her. She returned to the sofa, trying to ignore the unease that was building in her chest. But the sound of the bells didn't stop. It grew louder, clearer, as if it were drawing closer. And with it came a sense of dread that she couldn't explain. She tried to focus on the warmth of the fire, but the ringing was relentless, digging into her thoughts. Finally, she couldn't take it anymore. She grabbed her coat and stepped outside, the cold air biting at her skin as she walked toward the cliff's edge. The fog was thick, swirling around her like a living thing, and the sound of the bells grew louder with every step. As she neared the edge, she could see the waves crashing far below, but there was something else, something moving in the water. She squinted, trying to make it out, but the fog obscured her view. The bells rang louder, their melody strange and haunting, and for a moment, she thought she saw figures in the mist, shadows moving just beyond her vision. A shiver ran down her spine as she backed away from the edge. This wasn't natural. The bells, the fog, the shadows, they didn't belong here. She hurried back to the cottage, locking the door behind her and stoking the fire until it roared. 
but even as the flames danced and the warmth enveloped her, the sound of the bells persisted, echoing in her mind. Claire barely slept that night. When morning finally came, the fog had lifted slightly, but the uneasy feeling lingered. She decided to head into town, hoping to distract herself from the strange events of the night before. The town's small general store was run by an elderly woman named Mabel, who greeted Claire with a warm, albeit tired, smile. Claire hesitated for a moment, then decided to ask about the bells. Last night, I heard bells out by the cliffs. Do you know what that could have been? Mabel's smile faltered, and a shadow passed over her face. She glanced around the empty store as if to make sure they were alone, then leaned in close. You heard the bells? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Claire nodded, feeling a chill that had nothing to do with the cold outside. Mabel sighed, shaking her head. I was hoping it wouldn't happen to you, but once you hear them, there's no escaping it. The bells have been here as long as the town itself. They say they come from the sea, from the spirits of those who were lost in shipwrecks long ago. They call to the living, luring them to the cliffs. Claire's heart raced. Luring them? What happens if you follow the sound? Mabel's expression grew somber. Those who follow the bells, they never come back. Claire felt a wave of nausea wash over her. Why didn't you tell me this before I rented the cottage? Mabel's eyes were filled with regret. I didn't think you'd hear them. Not everyone does. But once you do, part they don't stop. Claire left the store in a daze, Mabel's words echoing in her mind. The bells wouldn't stop. They would keep calling her, drawing her to the cliffs, and if she followed them, she would never come back. That night, the bells returned, louder than ever. Claire sat by the fire, hands clenched in her lap, trying to resist the pull. But the sound was intoxicating, a strange, beautiful melody that seemed to wrap around her thoughts, clouding her judgment. She fought against it for as long as she could, but eventually the pull became too strong. She found herself standing at the door, hand on the knob, the sound of the bells filling her mind. Without realizing it, she stepped outside, her feet carrying her toward the cliff. The fog had returned, thicker than before, and the shadows moved within it. The bells rang out, their melody calling to her, and Claire felt herself slipping into a trance-like state, her body moving of its own accord. As she reached the edge of the cliff, the fog parted, revealing the ocean below. And there, in the water, she saw them. Dozens of ghostly figures, their eyes fixed on her, their mouths open in a silent song. The bells rang out from beneath the waves, beckoning her closer. Claire took a step forward, her mind screaming for her to stop, but her body refused to listen. The figures in the water seemed to smile as she approached the edge, their eyes gleaming with something dark and ancient. And then, just as she was about to step over the edge, the bells stopped. The fog lifted, and the figures vanished. Claire stumbled back, gasping for breath as the trance broke. She looked around, disoriented. But the ocean below was calm, the fog gone, the night silent. She had been inches away from falling into the abyss. Claire didn't sleep that night. At the first light of dawn, she packed her things and left Hemlock Point, now never looking back. But as she drove away, she couldn't shake the feeling that the bells were still there, waiting for her to return. And somewhere, far out at sea, she swore she could hear the faint sound of distant bells ringing in the fog. Story number eight. The small, isolated town of Ravendale was the kind of place where secrets thrived. Tucked away in a forgotten corner of the woods, it was surrounded by thick forests that seemed to stretch on forever, cutting it off from the rest of the world. Few people passed through, and even fewer chose to stay. When Elise inherited her great-aunt Margaret's house, she didn't hesitate to leave the city behind. The offer seemed like a gift from the universe, a chance to start fresh after a string of bad relationships and a soul-crushing job. She hadn't seen Margaret in years, but she remembered the stories her mother used to tell, how Margaret was the black sheep of the family, a recluse who dabbled in strange rituals and kept to herself. Elise shrugged off the rumors. She needed the escape and a house in the woods. The house was a creaky old Victorian perched on the edge of a still black lake. It was larger than she expected with too many rooms and too many dark corners. The air was thick with the scent of damp wood and age and every step she took echoed through the empty halls. 
She spent her first day exploring, opening doors to empty rooms, their windows covered in thick layers of dust. The house had clearly been neglected for years. Furniture was draped in white sheets, and cobwebs hung like veils from the ceiling. In one of the upstairs bedrooms, she found a large, ornate mirror leaning against the wall. The frame was gilded and intricately carved with symbols she didn't recognize. The glass was tarnished, the reflection cloudy and dim, but something about it drew her in. She reached out and touched the surface, her fingers brushing against the cool glass. A shiver ran down her spine as a fleeting sense of unease passed over her, but she quickly shook it off. It was just a mirror, after all. That night, Elise tossed and turned in bed, unable to sleep. The house was too quiet, the silence broken only by the occasional creak of settling wood. She tried to relax, to convince herself that the unease was just nerves, but the feeling of being watched persisted. At some point in the early hours of the morning, she gave up on sleep and decided to explore the house some more. Maybe a glass of water would help. She grabbed her phone and used its dim light to navigate through the dark corridors. As she passed by the bedroom with the mirror, she stopped. The door was slightly ajar, and she could see the mirror from the hallway, its surface glinting faintly in the dark. Curiosity got the better of her. She pushed the door open and stepped inside, her eyes fixed on the mirror. In the dim light of her phone, she could just make out her reflection, but something was off. The figure in the mirror didn't quite match her movements. It was just a fraction of a second behind, almost imperceptibly so. Elise frowned and moved closer, raising her hand slowly. The reflection mirrored her, but as she studied it, she noticed a subtle difference. The reflection's eyes were darker, its expression just a bit more sinister, as if it was mocking her. Her heart pounded as she took a step back, unnerved. She wanted to turn away, but she couldn't tear her gaze from the mirror. Then, without warning, the reflection smiled, a slow, creeping smile that sent a jolt of terror through her. Elise gasped and stumbled backward, nearly dropping her phone. She bolted from the room, slamming the door shut behind her. Her breath came in ragged gasps as she leaned against the wall, trying to convince herself that she had imagined it. It was late, she was tired, and the darkness was playing tricks on her. That had to be it. But deep down, she knew something was wrong with that mirror. The next day, she avoided the room altogether, throwing herself into the task of cleaning up the house. She scrubbed floors, dusted furniture, and tried to keep her mind busy. But the memory of that twisted smile haunted her. She could feel the mirror's presence, as if it was lurking just beyond her line of sight, waiting for her to return. As the sun set, casting long shadows through the windows, Elise finally sat down to rest. She was exhausted, but sleep seemed like an impossible feat after what she had experienced. The house felt even more oppressive in the dark, the shadows deepening into something almost tangible. When she couldn't take it anymore, she went back upstairs, determined to confront her fear. She needed to see the mirror in the light of day to prove to herself that it was just a trick of her imagination. She pushed open the bedroom door, her heart pounding in her chest. The mirror stood where she had left it, leaning against the wall. It looked perfectly ordinary in the daylight, the glass reflecting the room around it. But as she approached, she noticed something that hadn't been there before, a faint handprint on the surface, as if someone had pressed their hand against the glass from the other side. Elise's blood ran cold. She reached out to touch the handprint, but before her fingers could make contact, the mirror began to shimmer, the glass rippling like water. She stumbled back, watching in horror as the reflection changed. The figure in the mirror wasn't her anymore. It was a twisted version of her, with sunken eyes and a malevolent grin that stretched too wide across its face. It raised a hand slowly, as if beckoning her closer, its fingers elongating, nails turning into sharp claws that scratched against the inside of the glass. Elise screamed and backed away, but the reflection only laughed, a cold, hollow sound that echoed through the room. The glass shuddered, cracks spiderwebbing across its surface, but the figure didn't disappear. Instead, it pressed its face against the glass, as if trying to break through. Terrified, Elise bolted for the door, slamming it shut behind her. She could still hear the laughter, muffled but persistent, as if it was following her through the house. She ran downstairs, 
grabbed her car keys, and didn't stop until she was behind the wheel, speeding down the road away from that cursed house. She didn't look back, didn't care about the possessions she was leaving behind. All she knew was that she had to get away, as far away as possible. But as she drove, her hands trembling on the steering wheel, a thought struck her with icy dread. When she had looked into that mirror, when she had seen that twisted reflection, it had been smiling at her. No, not at her. It had been smiling for her. Elise glanced into the rearview mirror, and her heart stopped. The twisted reflection was there, sitting in the back seat, grinning at her with hollow eyes that promised she would never be truly alone again. Story number nine. The old mansion loomed at the end of the gravel driveway, its tall, gothic spires reaching into the gray sky like skeletal fingers. Ivy had crept over the cracked stone walls, weaving a tapestry of decay and neglect. This was the place Jenna had been searching for, the house her grandmother had spoken of in hushed tones, always with a hint of fear in her voice. As Jenna parked her car, the autumn wind rustled the leaves, carrying with it the faint scent of damp earth and something else, something sweet and rotting. She shivered, pulling her coat tighter around herself. The house had been abandoned for decades, ever since the last of the Ravensworth family had disappeared without a trace. The townspeople whispered about curses and restless spirits, but Jenna didn't believe in such things. At least, she didn't want to. Her grandmother's final words had been a plea. Find the house, Jenna. You need to know the truth. And so here she was, driven by curiosity and a desire to uncover the family secrets that had always lingered like shadows in the corners of her childhood. Jenna hesitated at the front door, the wood darkened with age and weathered by time. The brass knocker was cold to the touch, and the door creaked ominously as she pushed it open. The air inside was stale, thick with the scent of mildew and dust. She stepped into the grand foyer, her footsteps echoing off the marble floor. The house was silent, but it was the kind of silence that pressed against her ears, heavy and suffocating. The walls were lined with portraits of stern-faced ancestors, their eyes seeming to follow her as she moved deeper into the house. The furniture was covered in white sheets, ghostly shapes that hinted at a life long abandoned. Jenna had expected to feel uneasy, but the sense of foreboding that hung in the air was stronger than she anticipated. She shook off the feeling, reminding herself that the house was just that, a house. But as she moved through the dimly lit corridors, the hairs on the back of her neck stood on end. She made her way to the library, the room her grandmother had always spoken of with both reverence and fear. The door was slightly ajar, and Jenna pushed it open, the heavy wood groaning in protest. The library was vast, its walls lined with shelves crammed with old, leather-bound books. A massive fireplace dominated one wall, its hearth cold and empty. In the center of the room stood a large wooden desk, cluttered with papers and an ancient lamp. Jenna approached it cautiously, her eyes scanning the faded documents. They were letters, written in a spidery script that was difficult to read. She picked one up, the paper brittle in her hands. The letter was addressed to her great-grandfather, Edward Ravensworth. It spoke of strange occurrences in the house, whispers in the night, shadows that moved on their own, and a growing sense of dread that had begun to consume the family. Jenna's heart quickened as she read, the words echoing the stories her grandmother had told her. As she placed the letter back on the desk, she heard it, a faint whisper, so soft she almost thought she imagined it. Jenna froze, straining to listen. The whisper came again, clearer this time, a single word that sent a chill down her spine. Leave. Jenna spun around, but the room was empty. Her pulse raced as she tried to convince herself that it was just her imagination, a trick of the mind in an old, eerie house. But the whisper came again, more insistent, followed by the sound of footsteps above her, slow and deliberate. The logical part of her brain screamed to leave, to run back to her car and drive away, but something rooted her to the spot. She needed to know what had happened here, why her grandmother had been so adamant that she come. Taking a deep breath, Jenna left the library and made her way to the grand staircase that spiraled up into the shadows. Each step creaked under her weight, the sound echoing through the empty halls. The house seemed to grow colder as she ascended, the air thick with a sense of impending doom. The whispers grew louder, 
more urgent, but they were fragmented, indistinct, snatches of conversation that made no sense. Jenna reached the landing and followed the sound to a door at the end of the corridor. It was slightly ajar, a thin sliver of darkness visible through the crack. Her hand trembled as she pushed the door open, revealing a bedroom that had been untouched by time. The bed was neatly made, the curtains drawn, and a thick layer of dust coated every surface. But it was the figure standing by the window that made Jenna's breath catch in her throat. A woman stood there, her back to Jenna, dressed in an old-fashioned nightgown that fluttered slightly in the draft. Her hair was long and dark, cascading down her back in loose waves. Jenna's heart pounded as she took a hesitant step forward. Hello? Jenna's voice was barely a whisper, but the woman didn't move, didn't acknowledge her presence. Jenna swallowed hard and took another step, the floor creaking beneath her. The woman turned slowly, and Jenna gasped. The face was familiar, too familiar. It was her grandmother, but younger, her eyes wide and filled with a deep, unending sadness. Grandma? Jenna's voice trembled with disbelief. The figure's lips moved, but no sound came out. The whispers grew louder, surrounding Jenna, filling her mind with incoherent voices. She felt dizzy, disoriented, as the room seemed to spin around her. Leave. Her grandmother's voice finally broke through the cacophony, clear and desperate. You shouldn't have come here, Jenna. It's too late. Jenna stumbled backward, her heart racing. What do you mean? What's happening? But the figure of her grandmother was fading, dissolving into the shadows. The whispers became screams, the voices angry, filled with rage and sorrow. The air around her crackled with energy, and Jenna felt a cold hand brush against her arm. Panic surged through her as she turned and fled the room, the whispers chasing her down the corridor. The house seemed to come alive around her. The walls groaned, the floorboards buckled, and the portraits on the walls distorted, their faces twisted in agony. Jenna sprinted down the stairs, her only thought to escape. The front door was within reach, but as she grabbed the handle, it wouldn't budge. The whispers closed in, surrounding her, suffocating her with their malevolence. Please, Jenna cried out, her voice breaking. Let me go. The door finally gave way, and she burst out into the night, gasping for air. The house stood behind her, silent and looming, but the whispers had stopped, leaving only the sound of the wind and the distant rustling of leaves. Jenna didn't look back as she ran to her car, her hands shaking as she fumbled with the keys. The engine roared to life, and she sped down the driveway, the house disappearing in her rearview mirror. It wasn't until she reached the safety of the main road that she allowed herself to breathe. The silence in the car was overwhelming, and Jenna realized her hands were still trembling. She glanced at the passenger seat where she had placed the letters from the library. But the seat was empty. The letters were gone, as if they had never existed, as if everything she had experienced was just a terrible nightmare. But Jenna knew it wasn't. She could still hear the faintest whisper in the back of her mind, a voice that would haunt her for the rest of her life. You shouldn't have come here. The house, it seemed, had claimed another secret, one that would remain buried in the shadows of its ancient walls. And Jenna knew that some truths were better left forgotten, lost in the whispers of the past. Story number 10. Emily had always loved old houses. There was something enchanting about the history that clung to them, the stories hidden in every creaking floorboard and chipped paint. So when she found a beautiful centuries-old farmhouse nestled deep in the countryside for a ridiculously low price, it felt like a dream come true. The house sat alone at the end of a long dirt road, surrounded by thick woods. The nearest town was miles away, making it the perfect place for Emily to escape her hectic life in the city and focus on her art. She spent her first few days there exploring the house, marveling at the ornate woodwork, the high ceilings, and the stone fireplace that dominated the living room. But there was something odd about the house, too. The walls seemed to hum with a strange energy, and at night she could hear faint sounds, like whispers, coming from somewhere deep within the structure. She brushed it off as the creaks and groans of an old house settling, but a sense of unease lingered in the back of her mind. It wasn't until her third night in the house that things started to get truly strange. Emily had been painting late into the evening, lost in her work, when she heard a soft tapping sound. 
At first, she thought it was just the wind rattling the old windows, but when the tapping continued, she set down her brush and listened more closely. The sound was coming from inside the walls. She frowned, moving closer to the source of the noise. The tapping was rhythmic, almost deliberate, as if someone or something was trying to get her attention. She pressed her ear against the wall, holding her breath. Tap, tap, tap. The sound was louder now, more insistent. Emily felt a shiver run down her spine. She backed away from the wall, trying to convince herself that it was just an old house settling in the night. But the tapping didn't stop. It seemed to follow her, growing louder as she moved through the house. Finally, she couldn't take it anymore. She grabbed a flashlight and made her way down to the basement, hoping to find some logical explanation for the noise. The basement was dark and musty, filled with old furniture and forgotten relics from the past. She shone her flashlight around, searching for anything that might be causing the tapping. Then she saw it, something faint and faded, scratched into the wall near the far corner of the basement. She moved closer, her heart pounding in her chest as she illuminated the markings. They were handprints, small, childlike handprints, pressed into the old stone. Emily's breath caught in her throat. The handprints were smeared as if whoever had made them had been clawing at the wall. And then she saw the faces, dozens of them. Faint, ghostly imprints of faces etched into the stone, their expressions twisted in pain and terror. Emily stumbled back, the flashlight shaking in her trembling hand. She had never seen anything like it before. The faces seemed to stare at her, their hollow eyes following her every move. Suddenly, the tapping grew louder, more frantic. It was as if the walls themselves were alive, begging her for something she couldn't understand. Panic surged through her, and she turned to flee, but the basement door slammed shut with a deafening bang. She was trapped. The tapping was all around her now, echoing in her ears. The walls seemed to pulse, the faces shifting and writhing as if trying to break free from the stone. Emily's heart raced as she pounded on the door, desperate to escape. Let me out, she screamed, but the only response was the relentless tapping. In a frenzy, she grabbed an old hammer from a nearby shelf and began striking the wall. Pieces of stone chipped away, and with each strike, the faces grew clearer, more defined. The tapping intensified, becoming almost unbearable. Finally, with one last desperate swing, she broke through the wall. A cloud of dust filled the air, and Emily coughed, stumbling back as the debris settled. When she looked up, she saw a dark, narrow passageway leading deeper into the house, hidden behind the wall. Without thinking, she crawled through the opening, the air growing colder as she ventured deeper into the unknown. The passage was cramped and claustrophobic, and the further she went, the more she felt like something was watching her. The walls were lined with more faces, more handprints, their expressions frozen in silent screams. At the end of the passage, she found a small, hidden room. In the center of the room stood an old wooden chair, and on the floor beside it lay a pile of dusty, yellowed papers. Emily knelt down, her hands shaking as she picked up one of the papers. It was a diary entry, written in elegant cursive. They won't stop. The faces, the whispers, they are everywhere. The walls are alive, they are watching, waiting. I can't escape them. No one can. The entries grew more frantic, more desperate, until they ended abruptly. Emily felt a chill crawl up her spine. Whoever had written these words had known the same terror she was feeling now. A sudden movement in the corner of the room caught her eye. She turned, her breath hitching, as she saw a shadowy figure standing just beyond the reach of her flashlight's beam. It was tall and gaunt, its features indistinct, but its eyes glowed with a malevolent light. Before she could react, the figure lunged at her. Emily scrambled to her feet, running back through the passageway as fast as she could. The walls seemed to close in around her, the faces distorting into grotesque visages of anger and despair. The tapping followed her, growing louder, more frantic, until it was all she could hear. She burst through the opening in the wall, gasping for breath as she collapsed on the basement floor. The tapping stopped, and for a brief moment, everything was silent. Then, slowly, the basement door creaked open. Emily looked up, her heart pounding in her chest. But the doorway was empty. She forced herself to stand, her legs shaking as she made her way back up the stairs. The house was quiet now, eerily so, and the sense of being watched had disappeared. 
but as she reached the top of the stairs, she paused. The walls were still humming with that strange energy, and she knew, deep down, that the faces hadn't left. They were still there, trapped within the stone, waiting for her to make one wrong move. And somewhere, far below the floorboards, she could still hear the faint sound of tapping. 